And Mike has invited me to reflect with you for a little bit on the contributions of the teaching of psychological science in what is called by the Oxford dictionaries this post-truth era. This era as the Collins word of the year last year had it, this fake news era. This era in which Time Magazine is headlining and wondering is truth dead? And in which the Dilbert author Scott Adams is offering us a book on how to persuade in a world where facts don't matter. Facts don't matter. That's the subject of a New Yorker cartoon show here. I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the point. <laughs> so, is it really true? And to some extent, it is true that we have a problem. And there's bipartisan agreement. Republican Senator John McCain recently expressed alarm about the growing inability and even unwillingness to separate truth from lives. Hillary Clinton laments the war on truth, facts, and reason. And what has all these people, both Republicans and Democrats, upset? It's because oftentimes the public understanding of truth radically departs from what really is true. Let's look at some examples. First, here's a little graph of Americans' perceptions of crime showing us that in each of the last 10 years, about seven in 10 Americans believe that there was more crime in that year in the United States than there was in the year before. In the year before that, they believe there was more crime occurring than in the year before that. Uh, murder rate is the highest it's been in 47 years, said our president shortly after his inauguration. The rising crime rate is a dangerous permanent trend, said the new attorney general. Here is actually what's happened to the violent crime rate in the United States. The property crime rate has showed the same decline. Uh, national surveys of crime victimization show us the, sh the exact same decline. The truth is exactly the opposite of what the public perceives to be the truth. Or what about the perception that unemployment worsened? For example, two-thirds of Trump voters said unemployment increased during the Obama administration. That's what actually happened to unemployment, which two-thirds of people uh, of one partisan variety thought was going up. Or what about fears of immigrants? Mexico is sending us drugs, crime, rapists. Uh, uh, Donald Trump.com ad recently uh, lamented the evil Ill Ill illegal immigrants who commit violent crimes and gave us an image of a dastardly immigrant who had done a horrific crime. When in fact, uh, uh, most Americans are agreeing with that now. Uh, by a 45%, 5 to, to 9%, 5 to 1 ratio, Americans believe um, immigrants make the crime situation worse. Even though um, the Wall Street Journal, the Cato Institute, conservative places, are telling us that actually the truth is the opposite. And if you look and see who's incarcerated, you find that first, gen first generation immigrants have lower than average rates of incarceration in the United States. Uh, they're less crime prone, says the Cato Institute. Uh, I've given you so far some examples of political bias, if you will, from one side of the political spectrum. But researchers are telling us that it's bipartisan. A recent statistical digest shows bipartisan bias, both liberals and conservatives at virtually identical levels. So to give you an example from the other side, strong Democrats at the end of the Reagan presidency uh, thought that inflation had gotten worse under Ronald Reagan, that it had gone up. Only 8% thought inflation had come down. Here's what's happened to inflation under Ronald Reagan. It dropped dramatically. But strong Democrats, at the end of his presidency, perceived what was the opposite of the truth. So what explains this misinformation? What's going on? Why in these instances, as so many others, do people simply believe what is absolutely demonstrably false? To some extent, it is fake news. It's lies in the guise of news. It's planted misinformation that's intentionally meant to deceive. Sometimes it's just satire that's gone viral. A headline in The Onion or in the Borowitz satire from The New Yorker, like Trump threatens to skip remaining debates if Hillary is there, gets passed around as if it's true, not realizing it's a joke. But there are some interesting psychological mechanisms at work as well. So first, 
think about the power of mere repetition. Vaccines cause autism. Climate change is a hoax. Muslim terrorism is a grave threat. These are things we've heard repeated over and over and over again, even though in each case they're not true. For example, to take the last one, since 9-11, there have been 230,000 murders in the United States. Only 123 of them, an infinitesimal percentage, related to terrorist activity in the United States since 9-11. Toddlers killed more Americans than terrorists each year. Snopes checked that out and found it's true. Gun-wielding toddlers are more of a threat to us. Uh, so what explains the power of mere repetition? It's partly that statements, when repeated, come to seem, whether true or false, first of all, easier to process. They're because they come in easier to say. They, f they feel familiar. There's a kind of fluency effect. And they're easier to remember. A repeated statement or phrase, no collusion, crooked Hillary, or whatever, repeated over and over again, comes to stick to the mind like peanut butter. Repetition, mere repetition, has power. A second psychological dynamic that has great power is what we know as the availability heuristic, the tendency for vivid, dramatic information to implant itself in, in our minds and sometimes hijack our memories because how it stands out. And so, for example, a vivid anecdote about a horrific act by a first-generation immigrant, such as happened on the wharf in San Francisco where a man killed a woman by a ricocheting bullet. Uh, gets used as the prototype by which we evaluate and assess and define immigrants. But this is bipartisan. My wife came downstairs not long ago, upset by new U.S. immigration policies under the president after Mem Fox, the Australian children's author, was detained at Los Angeles airport and missed her talk at a Chicago conference because she was held up for several hours. This is just terrible what's happening. My response was to say, yeah, it was really terrible what happened to Mem Fox. That's an embarrassment. But that's a case of one. I had to look up and I found there were 51 million uh, people that entered the United States through immigration last year. Okay, now I know one person had a bad experience. I'm sure others did too. How common is that now compared to the past? I don't know. And the one case of Mem Fox gives me no clue to that. Uh, or I think, to bring this home to the high school context post Parkland, we are understandably very concerned about the safety of our schools and the safety of our kids and we're taking appropriate measures to protect them and well we should. But there is some tendency always to take whatever has recently been in the news and exaggerate the threat that that is rather than other things that are not so available in our consciousness. And so a Harvard risk expert recently noted that there's a one in 614 million chance of a child being shot and killed in school on any given day in recent American history. Far lower than almost any other mortality risk a kid faces, including traveling to and from school in a car. That's more dangerous. Or playing sports. Or guns in homes and neighborhoods. So, let's teach it. Uh, it's one of our maxims, one of our memes, if you will. The plural of anecdote is not data. And part of our thinking, smart teaching, smart thinking, critical thinking, is helping people to appreciate the difference between a story, an anecdote, a dramatic event that illustrates something, but that doesn't necessarily represent reality at large. And thus, we're led to, to, to think wrongly. By the way, another example of the power of recent immediate experience is our experience of the weather. If there's been terrible weather, like Louisiana flooding, people say that's evidence of extreme weather growing and climate change. Or if it's a particularly cold winter, you've had a cold April here in Minnesota. Uh, what about this climate change, global warming? Ha! Huh. Uh, and in fact, we have lots of studies that show that whatever is the current weather tends to bias people's perceptions of overall global climate change. On a hot day, they're more likely to believe in global warming than they are in an unusually cold day, generalizing from a mere isolated uh, anecdote. 
So rather than having their understanding of climate change swayed by such examples of today's weather, critical thinkers say, as we try to teach our students, show me the evidence. Over time, is the earth warming? Are the polar ice caps melting? Are vegetation patterns changing? And should we expect all this from the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? These are the kinds of questions that we want our students to ask. Repetition, availability, confirmation bias is the next one. I was really delighted on Wednesday evening as I walked out of a social gathering with my wife because twice in two different gatherings within about four hours I had heard non-psychologists talking about events in the world referring to confirmation bias as driving public opinion. I thought this was something just 10 years ago we started teaching and now it's making it into the public consciousness. The tendency to seek confirmation of what we believe and then to find exactly what we expect. Two-thirds of what we uh, see is behind our eyes. An example of this, uh, was, was President Obama a Christian or, or a Muslim? Of those people during the uh, last presidential election who were favorable to Donald Trump, by a five to one margin, they thought he was a Muslim. Of those unfavorable to Donald Trump, by a five to one margin, they thought he was a Christian. Now, he's one of those two things, but what I, I've shown you is that people are reading news and seeing evidence and picking up information and it's driving them to believe whatever it is they believe to begin with, to confirm their beliefs. Another dynamic that's at work is familiar to me from my own study, starting with my graduate's uh, work on what's called group polarization. And what we did in some of our studies is group people, sometimes in a high school context, with others who thought like themselves. And in one study, we brought together before and after discussion, high and low prejudice high school students, inviting them to discuss some issues relative to their added attitude differences. And as the high prejudice students talked among themselves about these dilemmas, they became even more prejudiced. And as the egalitarian students talked among themselves, they became even less prejudiced. We call that phenomenon group polarization, the tendency of group interaction to accentuate existing attitudes within a group. Well, social media now empower group polarization. They tribalize us. They enable us to connect with people that think like we do, to read blogs and news sources that fit into our way of thinking, and to discuss on Facebook and other, with li other places with like-minded friends, thus accentuating and polarizing the nation as a whole. So these are some of the dynamics that are at work. Uh, to help us understand why so often it seems that facts don't matter, not just because of fake news, but because of repetition and the power of readily available anecdotes and of confirmation bias and group polarization. And that brings me to a second question I want to ask with you today, and that is, is it true as some people fear, and as maybe some of your students' parents have worried, that this discipline of psychological science is liberally biased. Um, and what I'm going to suggest, to, and by the way, there's a lot of people saying this. Uh, I come from Betsy DeVos's hometown, and she told the Conservative Political Action Committee recently to, uh, to watch out for college professors uh, trying to control what you think with their liberal ideas. There's some evidence that Betsy DeVos may have some grounds for her concern. Here's national surveys of the political leanings of academics uh, over time uh, since about 1990. And as you can see, the percentage who describe themselves as liberal has increased, while the percentage who de describe themselves as conservative has slightly decreased. And if you look within psychology, you find, particularly in my field of social psychology, concerns about the liberal bias of social psychology. Are social psychologists against Republicans? Is this liberal bias hurting social psychology? Do we need more ideological diversity? And you know what? It's true. Social psychologists are mostly liberals. My friend John Haidt spoke to the National Gathering of the Society of Personality and Social Psychology in 2011. There were about a thousand of us in the room, and he asked for a show of hands. 
How many of you would describe yourselves as liberals? 80 or 90 percent of the hands in the room went up. How many of you describe yourself as centrists or moderates? About 20. Libertarians? About a dozen hands. Then he asked, how many of you would say you're conservatives? In that room of about a thousand, three hands went up. I looked around and saw those lonely three hands and I thought, oh, I hope the New York Times isn't here to record this. Uh, but they were, and it made national news. And later, there was a survey of members of the Society of Experimental Social Psychology, which is kind of an invited group of active researchers, asked them who they voted for in the recent election. 305 reported, reported that they voted for uh, Barack Obama. Mitt Romney got four votes. Okay, so I want to acknowledge, first of all, that there is a partisan bias among people in the field. That's a fact. But then I want to say, nevertheless, credit these psycho psychological scientists for being willing to let the data speak, even when it challenges their own biases and pre-existing ideas. And I'm going to give you some examples of really surprising findings that have overturned what we expected. And secondly, their findings sometimes affirm conservative perspectives and sometimes affirm progressive perspectives and values, and I'll give you some examples of each. So therefore, the pre-existing kind of partisan views of academics doesn't have to control the science because the data, nature if you will, is still capable of speaking for itself. Okay, now some examples of what I take to be surprising findings, things that when I started in the field I never would have guessed were true but all indications are that these things are true. First, electroconvulsive therapy works as a very powerful treatment for otherwise disabling depression that resists other forms of treatment. Who would have guessed that this brutal treatment giving people controlled convulsions would be therapeutic? But it is, and we don't fully understand why it is. But it's a surprise, and we've listened to the data. Or secondly, parental influence on children's personalities and intelligence is shockingly modest. I used to believe that parents shape their children rather like a potter shaping clay and forming their personalities and their intellects. But we have many studies of adopted children that find that two adopted children are hardly, within a family, are hardly more similar to one another for their shared parenting than, are, than they are to other children in the neighborhood. And we have a recent digest of nearly 15 million twins who've been studied in hundreds and hundreds of research studies, finding that across all human traits studied, heritability, that is the extent to which individual differences were attributable to, to genes, is 49%. And this is the shocking part of it, the data are inconsistent with substantial influences from shared environment, which is part of what the parents provide to the different children in the family. That's just a stunning result. Uh, or here's another shocker, seasonal affective disorder. I've taught it. I believed it. But there's a new major study, which is confirmed by a number of other studies, that looked at data from 34,000 people assessed by the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, and which asked, is depression more common around the winter solstice? Is it more common for those living in cloudy areas on cloudy days in higher latitudes with less winter light? The answer is no to all these questions. What? I thought seasonal affective disorder existed and that in dark places and times of the year, people were more likely to be depressed. The CDC data says that's not true. So I did a little study of my own. I went to Google Trends and it allows us to look at the frequency of different search terms over time across months of the year. So just as a kind of test of whether the system's working, I put in the word basketball. And as you would expect, uh, searches for basketball go up in winter time, peak in March. Okay, that's exactly what you'd expect. Or what about flu? Searches for the word flu are low in summer and higher in winter. Okay, what does it work for depression or sad? 
It's a little lower in July, but pretty much from early fall to late spring, it's just flat. Or if you take a phrase like, I am sad or I am depressed, there's just no difference across the year. So that confirms what the CDC is finding, which is that, shockingly, it looks like, although this story isn't finished, seasonal dif affective disorder may not exist. Uh, it's not what I believed, it wasn't what I expected, but as Agatha Christie's Miss Marple said, facts are facts, and if one is proved to be wrong, one must just be humble about it and start again. Um, so, first point is, are psychological scientists maybe progressive in their values? Yes, but they are capable of letting the data speak for themselves. And sometimes the data surprise us, and they challenge what we believe. And that's the way the system should work, isn't it? And secondly, I can offer you, I think, some examples where research has, independent of what I or some other psychological scientists might think or hope to find, the findings have affirmed conservative principles in some cases and progressive ideas in other cases. So let me just give you a few examples of each. First, we have a lot of evidence that people who are actively religiously engaged are at less risk for ill health, premature death, they experience greater subjective well-being, uh, they're more generous. Uh, we have research that on what's called the growth mindset, which I suspect as educators you've heard about, uh, and interventions showing us that people who are trained to regard their brains as a muscle that could be developed through hard work, in fact, are at less risk for failure, as middle school students, for example, or even as high school students. Uh, we have, in some studies, gone looking for sexism and not found it. And I can give you a first-hand story of this from uh, some, uh, what started, what began as a class demonstration. There was a very famous study that uh, put two names, either Joan McKay or John McKay, at the top of an essay, and then had students evaluate that essay, and which found that if it was written by, attributed to a man, John, it got higher ratings than if it was attributed to a woman, Joan. That was a very famous study. It was widely publicized, and I thought it was really cool, and I totally believed it. And so to demonstrate sexism in action, I replicated this in my social psychology classes. And to my astonishment, found no difference between the ratings given to John and Joan for the same piece of work. So my, uh, one of our students, Janet Swim, now a social psychologist at Penn State, uh, assisted me in searching all the published and unpublished literature on this phenomenon. And this eventually got assembled into a, an article in Psychological Bulletin digesting the whole research literature. And the bottom line is there was no, there is no effect of simply attaching a woman or a man's name to a piece of writing or various other kinds of work. <coughs> to our astonishment, it wasn't what we expected to find, it wasn't even what I hoped to find. I went in hoping to demonstrate something different. Or at Cornell University, Wendy Williams and Stephen Cece have published data recently showing that rather there being, than there being a preference for men over women as applicants for STEM positions in academia, it's the reverse. Uh, and they got assaulted. The myth that academic science isn't biased against women is just not even scholarship. This is just trash. They were, this was in the Chronicle of Higher Education. They wrote a reply saying, hey, uh, our guiding principle has been to follow the data whatever, wherever it takes us. It may not have been what we expected, but it is our obligation with integrity to report on the findings that we actually attained, and that's, that's, that's what we found. Or work at Rutgers University by Lee Jessam and others has repeatedly found that stereotypes often have a very large core of truth. We think of stereotypes as like totally inaccurate, but there's a phenomenon of stereotype accuracy. What people believe about others often is largely true, Lee Jessam says. Now, these aren't all comfortable findings, but I'm saying it's not what we set out to find, but there it is. Or what about support for the institution of marriage? That's certainly something the conservatives value. Indeed, marriage is associated with happiness, health, the flourishing of children, lower poverty rates in families. Uh, 
But today's high school teens don't believe that. Only about a third agree that most people will have fuller and happier lives if they choose legal marriage rather than staying single or just living with someone. Marriage doesn't matter to today's teens. And yet from national data harvested over the last 30 years, we know that the percentage of married adults who say they're very happy is dramatically higher than that of never married adults in the United States. And we also know from large studies done by the government of behavior problems in children that children are at lower risk for various kinds of problems, uh, emotional and behavior problems, if they, are, if they come from intact homes. And that's after controlling for, that is holding constant, parental education, race, and income, but allowing family structure to vary. So these are examples of findings that you, they may have come from liberal social scientists, but I think they're largely comfortable to people with conservative values rather than attacking those values. Um, so are there findings that progressives could appreciate? And indeed there are. Now there's other literature showing us, for example, the toxicity of extreme inequality. Where you have a community or a country that has extreme economic inequality, you have high rates of various forms of pathology. Places with great inequality tend to be less happy places, more social problems, higher rates of mental illness. Uh, here are data, for example, across a number of nations. So on the x-axis, we have income inequality. Those are the in unequal nations, uh, USA really being out on the extreme versus Scandinavian nations on this side. And this is a composite index of various health and social problems. The more unequal the society, the more it's social and health problems. Uh, and in fact, uh, researchers have found that nations with more progressive taxation systems have uh, greater scores on measures of subjective well-being. By the way, inequality is much greater than what most people know about. Uh, the percentage of U.S. wealth possessed by the top 20 percent is more than 80 percent. Most people, regardless of political party and income, think it's about a little over 50 percent. And most people, regardless of political party, think ideally the top 20 percent would possess maybe a third of the wealth. That's nothing close to reality. Um, another finding that has certainly been confirmed by recent science is that climate change is real and it's a likely weapon of future mass destruction. We know that from uh, not only increasing uh, climate change gases in the atmosphere, we can already now see that in the increasing global temperature, in the melting of the polar ice cap, in the increases in extreme weather. And this is all significant for psychology because we know that the disruption from future climate change is going to lead to displacement, trauma, and increasingly human conflict within societies as people seek to, seek to migrate out of devastated and drought-stricken areas and flooded areas. By the way, public opinion about climate change is not keeping up with the scientific understanding. This is an area in which it sometimes seems like the facts don't matter, with 97% of published climate scientists agreeing that human-caused climate change is occurring, but less than half the public concurring in that sentiment. Or another progressive finding, another one where I have to say my mind has changed over my lifetime by the evidence, and that is the the consensus conclusion among psychological scientists that sexual orientation is not a moral choice, it is a natural enduring disposition. Uh, and by the way, efforts to change it therefore are very difficult to achieve with any great success. One recent study demonstrated this for the umpteenth time with 1,600 and some same-sex attracted Mormons. Uh, two-thirds of whom attempted to change their sexual orientation and they found that among these 600 and 1,612 people a grand total of zero percent successfully did so by eliminating their same-sex feelings. Natural sexual orientation is persistent and enduring for just about everybody. So to recap what I've said so far is that we do seem to live in a post-truth world in which often people's opinions take precedent over factual reality. And our job as educators 
is to live into that world and to respond to it. Why is that the case? It's partly fake news, but it's partly also just the power of repetition. It's partly the power of the availability heuristic and of vivid anecdotes to implant themselves in our mind and alter our judgments. It's partly the power of confirmation bias driving what we perceive, whether it's what's out there or not. It's partly the power of group polarization. Is the academic world and psychology in particular liberal? Well, in one sense, I acknowledge, yes, it is. But give us some credit. We're committed to letting the data speak and sometimes to surprise us. And our findings support both conservative and progressive views. And so the science, it seems to me, is working and is honorable and is worth teaching. A couple more points. One, as antidotes to a post-truth world where misinformation is rampant, we have science and we have a religious perspective that values humility that provides the mandate for science. What do we want? We want evidence-based science. When do we want it? We want it after peer review. This is what we want our kids campaigning for out there, right? Um, and by the way, education does work. People who go through your high schools and complete them are more likely to see the world the way it is and to have less belief in conspiracy theories. And so this scientific attitude of curiosity that you're trying to cultivate with your high school students, of skepticism, an attitude that's always challenging, always asking, what do you mean? How do you know? What's the evidence for that? An anecdote isn't enough. A story isn't enough. And an attitude of humility that's willing to be surprised, to have your mind changed, to be open to reality as it is. And I do think that there's a religious mandate that supports this scientific perspective. If you're a person of faith, no matter what your faith tradition, you believe two things if you're a theist. First, you believe that there is a God. And secondly, you believe that it's not you and it's not me. Uh, and if that's the case, if we're fallible creatures, not gods, then it necessarily follows that we should hold our own beliefs, untested beliefs, tentatively. I'm not God. I'm wrong about something. It's the surest conviction I have. And secondly, we can assess others' ideas as well as our own with open-minded skepticism. We can put claims to the truth. When appropriate, we can use observation and experimentation to winnow error from truth. Moses had the idea, <clears throat> if a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and what he says does not come true, then it's not the Lord's message. That's empiricism. Uh, Jeremiah, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. If it doesn't work, then disbelieve it. Test everything, hold fast to what is good, said St. Paul. <clears throat> that could be a motto for psychological science. My own religious heritage calls itself reformed and ever reforming. It has this idea that we're not gods, we're always growing, we're always reforming, we're always changing in the spirit of humility. And that's what underlies science, and that's what the New York Times has in mind when it says that in this post-truth era, Truth is now more important than ever. Indeed it is, and so is our teaching of psychological science now more important than ever. One more lesson, though. I'm reminded of E.B. White, who said, I arise in the morning torn between the desire to save the world in a post-truth era and a desire to saber the world. And I hope that your students teaching that your teaching and your students reading and studying of psychological science helps them become smarter, more critical thinkers about the world around them. But I also hope that it helps them to appreciate the wonder of who they are. Just think about it. Imagine, for example, to give you one example, of an alien species that could pass thoughts from one head to another merely by pulsating air molecules in the space between them. That science fiction reality is what's happening right now as my voice box generates sound waves, air pulses that strike your eardrum, causing the bones of your middle ear to vibrate, causing the fluid-filled waves of the cochlea to bend hair cells, which trigger electrical impulses that travel up to your cortex. As a result of that whole process, 
from air pressure waves to mechanical waves to fluid waves to electrical waves up to your brain, you hear. And we have wirelessly transmitted through space an idea from my mind into your mind. Who would have dreamt up this process in the beginning? It's spectacular. And it's just one of the many wonders that's part of being human. So I hope that at the end of the course, as your students who have taken the AP exam this last Monday, for example, finish their study of psychology, they think smarter. But they also appreciate what the psalmist long ago, long ago said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are amazing creatures. And so that's my word of encouragement for you today as you continue teaching psych psychological science in this post-truth era. Thanks so much to all of you for taking the time to come out today. Yeah.